So first up is um, Olivier Dominique from uh, Lipsy, and he already has his slides up, digital signature. So, and now it's your turn to turn on the microphone. So, yeah, okay. So, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for attending today. My name is Olivier Dominique. I work for Lipsy Technology. Uh, for those who never heard of the company, we are a Swiss owned company that uh, provides uh, solutions and services in the areas of. IT security and software development with uh, references uh, the Swiss uh, government and clients uh, in different uh, domains like industry, um, finance, and uh, trade, insurance, telecommunications. Uh, so the topic today is uh, qualified electronic signature and uh, how uh, previous HSM can help you to build a remote selling service that uh, is going to deliver qualified signatures. Uh, so maybe first a few reminders of what an electronic signature is. So an electronic signature is um, the indication, the electronic indication of a person's intent to agree to the content of a document or a set of data to which the signature relates. So it is like uh, the digital counterparts of a handwritten signature on a document. Oops. Okay. So the, the regulation, uh, the ATAS regulation for the EU and the CRTS regulation for Switzerland define three levels of electronic signature, but simple electronic signature, advanced electronic signature and qualified electronic signature. And each of these, uh, the requirement of each level of signature is built on the top of the others. So if you have a qualified signature, it will meet the requirement for the simple and the requirement for advanced signature. The simple signature is very basic. It's defined as okay, whoops data in electronic form which is attached to or logically associated to another data in electronic form and which is used by the signatory to sign. So basically something as simple as your name at the end of an email can be considered a simple electronic signature. And of course, it's not something very secure. It can be forged easily, you can check the content of the, of the email, etc. So on top of that, you uh, the advanced electronic signature, which is required to be uniquely linked to the signatory and also provide the capability of identifying the signatory. You see, this signature must be created in a way that allows the signatory to retain control of its uh, intent to sign. And it should be linked to the document in a way that any subsequent changes to the document itself is detectable. <clears throat> and then finally, you have the qualifying signature that must, on top of everything up there, be created by a qualified signature creation device and must be based on a qualified certificate for electronic signature. The qualified certificates for electronic signature are provided by public or private providers which have been granted a qualified status by national competent authority. In Switzerland, the requirements to be fulfilled by qualified providers and qualified certificates are defined by the ZTS law. And for example, Swisscom or Swissign are trusted Swiss service providers. You can get qualified certificates from those two entities. And many providers will, uh, many provider of qualified qualified certificate will deliver the corresponding private key on the qualified certificate signature device. Qualified signature creation device comes in many forms. It could be a smart card, SIM card, USB token. And the alternative to that kind of device that you own as a signatory is a remote signature creation device where the device is not owned by yourself but owned by a man, uh, managed by a provider. <clears throat> the 
this qualified signature device solution offer an improved user experience because you don't have to take your device each time and remember your pin code and stuff. It's all managed for you. But if you want to use that kind of device to create a qualified signature, <clears throat> you have to implement the SCAP2, which, which is the acronym for Soul Control Assurance Level 2. So what is this card do? The goal is, that, uh, is to ensure that the signing keys are used with a high level of confidence under the sole control of the signer. It is aimed at achieving the same sole control assurance level as would be achieved with a standalone QSCD that you own in your physical possession. <coughs> and so the standards established for that does not define exactly how you must activate your key, but it defines security requirements on your key activation process. For that, you must define a signature protocol that defines a set of necessary steps in order to create a signature. And that activation protocol shall generate activation data. So the signature activation data, they should be linked to the authenticated signer at a substantial level. And this also should be linked to the data to be signed remotely to protect from any replay attacks. You don't give your consent one once and then you can sign many times whatever you want with that first consent. <clears throat> they also should be generated under the, under the sole control of the signer. So this is a point that makes it as safe as owning the creation device. <clears throat> and at the end of the protocol, the activation data should be transmitted to a signature activation module, which is a piece of software that must be running in the signature creation device temper-protected temper environment. And this module checks the validity of the activation data in order to activate the key. So if we look at the big picture for the, the architecture of a remote service <coughs> system, you've got here the application that the user is going to use to review its document, fill the forms if it's a form document, uh, draw its graphical signature, etc. And this application will hand the, uh, the document to a signature creation application here which will use this document to create signature data, and it will sign the, the signature data with, uh, with the help of the signing server application here. <coughs> then once it's got the signature, it will add some uh, information about the certificates used for signing, to see if they were still uh, good certificates not being revoked and expired and so that you can check the signature. When you check the signature, you can verify the authenticity of, those, uh, of that signature. And the server signing application uses here the DHSM, basically, so compose of this activation module and creation device <laughs> to generate the signature under the control of the user. And this control is done by here a signing a signer interaction component, which would be a device to be uh, your phone or something like that. And this stick is used to generate the activation data transmitted to the server via the activation protocol. So currently I'm working on uh, a server setting application and uh, to, to implement this, uh, this device, the creation device, we use the Primus X HSM. And the HSM takes all the requirements for um, being a qualified signature creation device. And uh, it also have, <coughs> has a, a set of <coughs> dedicated functions, so the size is SKA that we've 
mentioned before in the previous presentation, to manage the key access. And they, uh, they will enable us to uh, implement the requirements for a trustworthy system supporting server signing and especially the creation module, the, the, the activation module functionality. So, uh, if we look how to use those uh, creation attributes that we mentioned a uh, number of times uh, during this, uh, this session, <coughs> by looking at some code. Uh, so first, we, we need to generate uh, a key, a signing key on the HSM, so we prepare a key generator. <coughs> Find a nice name for the key, password. Here we set up the, uh, the, proprietary, the proprietary, proprietary for the key, so it will be a signing key. And we store it on the HSM, it will not be extractable, it will be uh, a sensitive key. We don't want it to get out. And then, if you ever generate your signature using the, the, the Java API for the premise of HSM, we will we, we know the code. It's, we generate the key pair and clean the environment so that the next key we generate, we can generate new parameters. Now, if you want to use the SKA attributes for that key, uh, you will first need another key pair, which is here to simulate the key, the authentication key that uh, the signer will possess. Normally, you would receive the private, the public key of that key pair when the user is onboarded, for example. Here, we generate, we generate uh, a local key just for the, for the example. <clears throat> then you will create an access group, so it is uh, the, the list of public keys that will be able to unlock the signing key. The quorum that has been mentioned before is also uh, defined when you create the access group. Here, for my example, I have a quorum of one, so it's one owner of one key. <coughs> the time frame here. That was mentioned before, the time lock, time out. I uh, put everything together in an access token and create here this previous access object with the four different policies that were mentioned uh, in the previous uh, presentation for the uh, key unlock, key lock, key activation, and uh, modification. And then the same way you set the key capability and access flags, you set the access properties. Key generation is not impacted. And after key generation, you just clear the attributes. So it's a rather simple integra integration uh, if you compare to, the, to what you were doing before using escape. Now that we have a key, you may want to sign with it. So how does it work? Again, we create some random data that we want to sign. And here, the usual way to sign with the previous uh, HSM. But if you do that with a key that has uh, the smart key attributes, it will generate an exception. You sign will fail because it is, has not been released. So the, the user, the, the equivalent of the user, doesn't gives the consent to use the key to sign. <clears throat> so, here we need another key, which is an integrity key. So, in the case we use the time lock or the time frame, it will be used to generate um, uh, a timestamp on the data that we want to sign. So, this key, you can reuse it. You can have to generate a new one for each time you, you need to unlock the keys here to reuse. <coughs> so we generate here the timestamp on the data here that we want to sign. <coughs> we put that timestamp in, in an approval token together with the payload we want to sign, the key that we want to use. And here we state that what we want to perform is a signing operation. 
And here is the way you give uh, the, your, um, you agree to use the key. So normally you would send here the token challenge to the signer and he would use this creation, this uh, signature, this statistic uh, component to create and validate the data, send it back to your server. <coughs> but here I do it locally, so the result of this operation is a, a previous authorization token. So it is data that is, has been signed using the private authorization key. So this is the part that, that remains normally in control of the signer. And uh, finally, so you, you, you got back your token, you put it in a previous authorization structure, and you set the authorization on your key. In the case of, uh, of a multi core more than one, for example, you would have here a list of tokens into your, uh, into your authorization to you assemble all your tokens, and this is what is done in the TSB. You put everything together before and did it to the HSM by this operation. And then, in that case, your signature will succeed. <coughs> so the, what I found easy in, that, uh, in using SK for that project is that <coughs> the, 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 oh, before that, maybe, if we look at the code from the standard point of view, so what we have here, the token challenge, is the signing <coughs> activation data, technique signature activation data. It is uh, linked to the, the data that we want to sign, and it is also linked to the signatory, and it's, it is um, <coughs> The, the fact that we use a signature here with a private key that is in possession of the signatory make, makes it uh, makes it uh, the, the substantial level that we need to achieve to, to validate the fact that the, the owner gave it its permission. And so this whole portion of code is the signature activation protocol that we must define to, uh, to be able to deliver a qualified, a qualified signature. <clears throat> and so the, the easy point to use SK was that um, if, you're, if you're, your code to sign uh, the signature here is embedded somewhere in the library that you already developed for normal keys without uh, smart key attributes, you don't have to touch that, that code. You can surround the code, the code to your library by the, the key management uh, for the uh, for the smart key attributes. So if you have an existing existing processes, if you have existing software, you can uh, put it to the next level using the smart key attributes without uh, without having to break everything. Which was uh, quite easy uh, from my development point of view to use, and uh, also quite uh, had quite good support from. Uh, Cyprus. So Eric, if you hear me, thank you for your yeah. thank you for your help. <laughs> and um, well, that uh, concludes uh, my short presentation of how you use smart key attributes. If you have any question. <laughs> thank you very much, Olivier. Um, uh, maybe we'll, we will uh, talk to Eric, and uh, he's still on vacation today. He's back uh -huh. tomorrow, so we will tell him uh, <laughs> that he was uh, providing good support to, to you. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, any questions? I mean, uh, for me, it's it's. Uh, I'm quite grateful that you actually uh, dared to show code on a developers <laughs> conference. So. Um, and whoever wants to build a digital signing system and just uh, yeah the recipe here it's it's not that complicated as yeah. i mean i'm not that i want to build it um, but uh, as all of you said uh, a lot of stuff is provided but uh, there is yeah. still a lot of work in there yeah. that we don't see yeah. here so i <laughs> really had to under these uh, smart characters really had to implement 
the, the, the document I mentioned before, uh, which is uh, quite a complex uh, list of requirements. And having that embedded inside the, 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 the HSM was really the key point because you trust that and from, from, from a developer point of view, you don't have to you know, fulfill all those requirements they are built inside the HSM. That was our plan to remove complexity from the application and provide it as a as a feature, as a, as a functionality to to the user. But uh, I want, would like to open the floor for questions here um, um, for uh, Olivier. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question around. So you still require the client to have a private key probably in their phone or laptop? Yes, the, so, the project that we're building, the, the QC will be in the enclave of an iPhone. Okay, and you know, if you already have uh, the client owning some key material, what is the point of the, putting it in the HSM as well? Is it just a backup mechanism or? It is, uh, it, it is uh, well, not a backup mechanism, but the, the HSM is much more secure that, than the phone. If you look at the the qualifications of the, the HSM. The, the iPhone matches the requirement, or barely matches the requirement that the EU has to be the activation device. So being the qualified signature device is something else. And for example, if you don't want to do qualified signature, but advanced signature, which is the level below, if you want your signature to be, uh, to be green in Adobe, well, if you want to be listed by Adobe as a trust service provider, you have to, you must have a key on the NHSM in their requirements. Okay, any, any other questions? Sir? Okay. So, I think we, we just go ahead and uh, have uh, our next uh, speaker get ready. First, uh, thank you very much, Olivier.